Welcome to the Divorce Angel Podcast. I'm your host, Tanya Summerton. Attention business owners, senior managers and executives, your successful separation begins right now. We have the answers to the questions you did not even think to ask. Let's face it, you're already successful in your career and we're here to help expand your knowledge and limit your costs by designing a strategy for your divorce. We take all that business knowledge you've acquired and we put it to work. With proven strategies, systems and processes, we've saved our clients tens of thousands in legal fees and helped define their future. And now we're doing the unthinkable. We're revealing the secrets the lawyers have tried to hide and giving you our formula for five steps to a seamless divorce. We're changing the world one divorce at a time, so stay tuned. Hi, everyone. Well, what can we say? What a week, what a few weeks it's been. It doesn't matter where we live in the world at the moment. Things are pretty much, or they seem to be out of control. We're doing everything as a society hopefully, and you're doing your bit to make sure that we stay at home, that we do what we need to do, and we try and control this virus. It will be certainly a time in most of our lives that we have never, ever seen a pandemic like we're seeing right now. And all I want to say is I don't know where you are listening from in what part of the world, but I certainly send all of my love, my best wishes to you and to your family and hope that you are okay and you are dealing with this as best you possibly can. A consequence of this though, however, will be a lot of relationships are going to be pushed to the extremes. A lot of relationships are going to find those things that they thought that they could ultimately um, cover up or hide, unfortunately, are now going to be warts on their nose. It's not going to be able to be hidden because relationships, unfortunately, are going to be under so much stress. And look, it's seriously it's understandable because as a society we are under so much stress at the moment and even being locked away where we've got all these lockdown rules which are pretty much seem to be happening on the in the majority of the world at the moment we have to spend time with the people in our homes and it's going to cause conflict there's no doubt about it in this podcast I wanted to talk about the best way to actually tell your partner that you no longer want to be married. Now, in a lot of what I'm going to go over here, it might not be happening while we're in lockdown and it's best not to happen right now. It's best for you if you really do think that your marriage is not going to last because of what's happening and you will want something else. I want you to really contemplate the consequences of that. And what we've done as a team, we've put together a video series to help people at this time because it's frightening. But before I go into the video series and when you, where you can find it, I just want to give you some tips and techniques to try and help you have the conversation with your partner. So how to leave your marriage the right way. So The first part is setting the scene. And what we want to do when we're setting the scene is we want to make sure certainly that you're not doing it in a public place. You're not doing it in front of the children. That you are making sure that just you and your spouse or your partner is somewhere quiet, somewhere where you've got time to have a real discussion about your future. You want to choose a location that is quiet and private. You don't want the TV on. You don't want to be out for dinner, not that that would be happening right now, but you don't want to be in a restaurant where maybe the table next door, though people are having a really good night and here you are about to say to your partner, I don't want to be married anymore. Can you imagine the difference between them thinking that everything possibly might be for fun and all of a sudden it turns into this horror and nightmare. The difference between the two will cause them to have that memory for a very long time. You want to also consider your stance and where you are going to sit when you start this conversation. 
Is it going to be around the lounge suite? Is it going to be across the kitchen table? But the last thing I want to see is someone yelling from the top of the stairs because it's not going to get you anywhere. And if you think about the bigger picture, the bigger picture is trying to find whatever it is that you're searching for to make you happy. And whilst you might be feeling utterly exhausted, ready to blow like a volcano, doing it this way is going to have long-term ramifications. You want to have thought through this and you want to make sure it's what you want to do. You need to consider the time of day, which day of the week, and obviously your location. But if there's a certain time where the kids are up running around or there might be a day of the week where maybe your partner works from home or you can come home and you know that you're going to be able to have a chat and not have any disruptions, you know, that might be the time that you want to contemplate this. So that's pretty much step one. The next part is practicing your speech. And I do this quite often with my clients now and we will workshop and we will one of us will take on the role of the partner as we try and practice the speech because in a lot of cases I can promise you whatever you think is going to happen, it probably won't. So when you practice your speech, it might be along the lines of we need to talk. I feel that our relationship is not working. Before you went away on the weekend, you said to me that you couldn't keep living like this. And there'll be things that your partner has said to you that you will be able to use when you start to have this talk with them. And what you need to do is when you're practicing your speech, look at yourself either in the mirror and imagine that you're talking to your partner or you might have a friend or someone that could take on the role of your spouse that you can practice what you might be going to say to them because that's really important and I can tell you that my clients when we practice this speech they've got more confidence they feel like they know what they need to say and they can go about it because they've practiced it a few times over in their head. The next part is words you should and should not use. Does your partner have certain words that he or she reacts to? Are there words that you know, for instance, if you say them, you will antagonize them and get some form of response? This is not the time that you want to use those words. It really is not the time. What you want to try and do is it's at this particular stage when you're having this conversation that they will remember it the most. So I want you to use words like we, us, together. And the reason is if you come from that position rather than me or I or you, it means that you're not pushing blame onto one person or the other. It means what you're actually trying to do is say, this isn't working for us. We need to be considering our future. When you use words like that, it looks like you're going to tackle this from a team position. It's not like you're saying, it's all your fault, I feel like this. You could also say, Things like, if we were honest with each other, this relationship hasn't been loving for a long time. Or, I'm not prepared to live an average life as flatmates. We need to find our own happiness. So can you see what I'm doing? I'm What I'm trying to do is make it look like you guys are both in this together and it's not working for either party. Look, whether you feel like this or not, and you actually do think your partner has a lot of blame to take for the downfall of your relationship, I completely understand that. And if you want to, you can certainly tackle it from that position. But what I've witnessed and seen is the people that have spoken to their partners this way have got a much better outcome. Because what's happening is the partner can see that 
you are looking at this from a position of not being selfish, but rather from a position of what's best for everyone. And it's at that stage where they really need to look, they need to look at the situation and they can't just simply say, oh, but I'll do this and I'll do that because you're talking about we and us. So during the speech, there's a few other things that you need to to do and say. And you need to be respectful whenever possible. Now, there's no doubt that things will get emotional, but if you can continue to try and just stay at the same monotone, so when you're talking, you don't want to be raising your voice or yelling or things like that. You want to try and just keep the same monotone in your voice. Why? Because that shows that you've really thought through the process and you're trying to calm it down. So when they try and get a reaction, if you don't give a reaction, in their mind, they've really thought about this. I'm not getting anywhere. There's very little I can do. You want to take a deep breath before you speak. Now, the greatest tool that we have in a lot of cases is to either slow down our our talk and our conversation and just take it slowly. And one of the greatest tools that I teach my clients is when they're talking to their partner about leaving is just to allow there to be silence. Because when there's silence, someone needs to fill the void that's either going to be your partner and they're going to continue to talk and maybe say things that they're getting off their chest or or what they're going to do is understand that there's little they can do to try and talk you around. When there's silence, it also means that you're contemplating what is going on. You're not just quickly rushing to fill the void. When people learn sales techniques and really good sales technique, a skill is silence because that's allowing the other person's brain to think through things. And the other part of that is most of us, and I used to be exactly like this, we hate it and we want to fill it. And because we want to fill it, we say things. So silence is a key So I've already spoken about not raising your voice and trying to stay at the same monotone and volume. And this shows restraint and consideration rather than just off-the-cuff emotional responses. Something else is to consider what your partner is going through when you're telling this. So put the shoe on the other foot and just ask yourself, how would they be feeling? And it's not going to be easy. It's going to be quite difficult. And I'm sure you're going to do a wonderful job and be respectful, but always just consider what it is that they're going through as well. Something that I learned long ago, when you ask a question and you've allowed for silence and you're getting your partner to respond Go back and say to them, do you understand what I've just asked or do you understand what I've just said? The reason this is such a great tool is because how our minds work, in most cases, especially at a time like this, if you imagine that let's say you said a hundred words in a paragraph and you've told them how you feel and what why you're making this decision they're not going to hear the hundred words that you've said. All they're going to hear will be probably a few key words. And in most cases, those key words that they've heard will either have an emotional response or a negative response. People don't often hear the very good things that you say. They only hear the bad. For instance, if your boss was telling you that you uh, were going to lose your job, There's a a method called the bathtub method and I was taught it in my corporate role and it's like where you start at a very positive and you tell the person, you know, this is the situation, you're very good at what you do, I think you're excellent, you've done some really good results 
and that's the top of the bath. And then you go into the negative and whatever's gone wrong and then you bring them back up the other side and you finish on a positive. I don't know how many times, but people don't hear the positive. They only hear the negative in the middle. So for instance, if you were to say to your ex-partner or to your husband or wife, I really love our life together, but there's something that's just not right at the moment for me. I've tried to work through everything, but I just can't see how we as a couple can move on from this. What you're doing is you're, you're outlining your thought and why you've come to this decision. Now, all they might hear in that sentence is, we just can't go on like this, even though you've tried to outline everything else. So the key is, is to go back and ask them, can you repeat what I said? Because at emotional times like this, by them repeating what you said themselves, they are reiterating everything. So you might ask why this is important. And it might not mean a lot to some people, but it can to others. The reason that it's important for someone to repeat what you've said is because in their mind, it is then sunk in. And it also means that they can't go around and say to other people, oh, she said this or he said that or whatever, because actually that's not what you said. For you, least you know, you have reiterated why the decision's been made and that could have a great outcome on how they talk about you. Not that it matters because whatever someone says about you, that's their issue, not yours, but it helps you to understand that they completely got what you said. It's actually a really good tool also with children is asking them to just go over what they've been told. There's other things when you're doing your speech, there'll be certain things that your partner has always said to you, such as we just live as housemates. They will be getting across to you problems that they've seen in the relationship for a while. I want you to use those words when you talk to them back to them. You're coming from their point of view and you're saying, you've recently said we just aren't getting along. You've recently said things just seem to be so hard. You've recently said whatever they've said. And then you say, I totally agree. What do you think we should do? So you're asking them to be part of the solution as well. And then the last part of this is the consequences of what you guys are going to talk about. Where are you going to sleep after you've had this talk? Who's going to leave? When will you be telling your family and your kids? And how are you going to do that? Is there any chance to reconcile? And have you thought about just in case it doesn't go how you planned? Your partner says, can we just give it another go? And that happened to me. I had to talk to my husband He said, oh, look, could we just give it another try? Could we just give it another month and we'll try and do this and let's work on that? And sometimes you just have to, for your own peace of mind, give it another month. Even though deep in my soul, I knew it was never going to work. I felt like I had to do what was right for everyone else and I gave it another month. It didn't work and then we had to have another talk a bit later. And sometimes you're just prolonging the inevitable, which is my advice, But sometimes you just need to do it as well. You know, you have to make that choice at that stage. No one can do that for you. And then how are you going to pay the bills? Do you need to sell the house? What about your business? Like the list of consequences from a chat like this go on and on. It's not going to be a comfortable conversation, but you want to do it from a place of kindness and respect if you possibly can. Now, I do this when I'm working with clients and as I said, we will workshop it and I might throw in a curly one here and there just to see how they might react. What you've got to understand, it has nothing whatsoever to do with you. What they say and what they do is up to them. How they react is up to them. But how you say it is your responsibility. How you react is your responsibility. So to help you guys out a little bit better, because 
we seem to be doing this quite a lot recently, I've put together a video series. Now, you can go to my website, which is tanyasummerton.com, and I've put together a free video series for all of my clients and for you guys if you're about to go through this to help you understand the steps that you should take and just to make it a little bit clearer. So to find this, go to the website, go under programs, go to the action center and under the action center, which is a free resource where I give away eBooks and obviously anything new that we develop goes straight up into that portal you can download the video series and the workbook and work through the steps that you have to do to really think clearly about having this talk or conversation with your partner. We will put the information and a link in the show notes and obviously you can also get it on Apple and Stitcher and wherever you find us. But go and review that video series and hopefully it helps you really be able to Think clearly and get your mind around this life-changing conversation. I appreciate you. I love you. I'm sending you nothing but kindness and best wishes. And hopefully we as a society will get stronger and humanity will become a better place when this is all over because we will have learnt some really good lessons, not only for ourselves, but for us as a whole. I'll talk to you all later. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Divorce Angel podcast. Go behind the scenes of my business to learn the secrets no one else will share. Deep dive into the Divorce Angel process and listen to our most popular episodes over at tanyasummerton.com. If you love this episode of the podcast, do me a favor and head over to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review so we can reach more people and change more lives. That's all for now and I'll catch up with you next week.